David, as always, thanks for joining. Uh, David. David. Great I guy. can't even say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I think I'm going to give it. I think we're, we're gonna give it a go. Does that sound good? You guys all ready? Um, so first of all, thank you, thank you to everyone for joining today. Uh, we were chatting pre-broadcast uh, pre that we know there are a lot of options for people to join webinars right now. And um, so we're glad that you joined ours. This is a very important topic for many people, whether they're currently looking for their next uh, uh, career path or career choice or you're just looking to continue to develop yourself, we're going to have so many great topics today to discuss. So before I hand it over to this wonderful panel, um, just a quick note about who I am and who GWPP is um, and what our group is all about. So um, I'm going to spare the PowerPoint presentation today for those who have been on these uh, for uh, the last several months. So GWPP is all about empowering women and men to have their best careers um, whether it's within procurement or outside of procurement, we just want to empower you to live your best career day in and day out. So we bring you content like this to help you do that. You will typically not find in our group like how to negotiate the best contract or do the, the technical job within, uh, within the procurement realm. It's more about topics like this one, personal branding. Um, uh, we had a conversation about relationships last week. So it is uh, more about the softer skills within our day-to-day -day lives that we are uh, discussing here today. So um, GWPP is fairly new, but we are over 4,000 strong um, on LinkedIn. So look us up on LinkedIn and you'll find day-to-day -day conversations going on in our LinkedIn group. And then we also have a beautiful website that um, keeps people up to date on latest and greatest uh, conversations that are going on. Um, so with that said, I'm Amanda Prochaska. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today leading this panel. I am the CEO of um, GWPP and um, there, there's so much conversation today about what is going on in the job market. So um, I'm assuming we're going to get a ton of questions from everyone today. And um, so if you want to ask questions, we already have some people chatting away on the chat, um, but you can also use Q&A and we are going to make this very interactive where we're going to be taking your questions and comments, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the conversation today. So all of that said, let's get, let's get going on, on what's really uh, the conversation is all about. So for the panelists, I would love you to introduce yourselves when you get your first question so people know a little bit more about you and the perspective that you are coming from. So Deb, since I know I've known you for now, um, it feels like, I don't know, five years, but I think it's been about a year and a half. Um, I love you, your perspective so much. Uh, you have such a focus on hope and, and a positive outcome. And so I'd love to start with you around what is the message of hope and encouragement that every professional in transition needs to hear right now? Oh, I love that question. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Um, so yes, my name is Deb Kalitas. I am based out of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with Northeastern Pennsylvania, we're just an hour and 10 minutes north of Philadelphia. We're south west of uh, you know, New York City. So we're in this nice little bubble between you know, metropolises. Um, but you know, part of my journey to get me to where I am today, where I'm a digital communication specialist. So my company, Digital Network Superstar, what we do is we make others in their companies the superstar because that's what needs to happen. We have an in-person and online presence now, whether we like it or not, people are Googling us, people are looking on LinkedIn. And how do we make sure that everything comes together with the right messaging and the right time? So reflecting with hope and uh, just uh, persistence and a hustle and looking forward to awesome things ahead. My personal journey has been one of immense entrepreneurship. Then I went corporate and then I came back into entrepreneurship. And so I understand what you need to do to represent yourself as a brand, if it is your brand as a company and a person, but also if you're representing somebody else's brand and need to take it on as your own. And the hope comes into play right now, if you are in transition, that everybody is trying to figure things out. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody actually knows 100% what's going on. There's predicted trends, there's we think this is gonna happen, but as uncertain as things are, the greatness of the uncertainty is everybody is figuring it out together. And so no one is alone or gonna be left behind here. There's gonna be new opportunities that certainly come about because whenever a void happens, greatness begins coming out of it. But that is then the ability to have hope with determination that you might learn something new, you might have a great new opportunity, and it may be totally different than what happened before, but you have to get up every 
every day, you have to at least get out of the pajamas at least a couple days a week, or at least be bottom down pajamas and top up professional. Uh, whatever you need to do, it's just, you know, go after it because opportunities are there online. Just like right now as we're meeting, I hope every single person that's watching this is going on all of our LinkedIn's right now and sending us little messages because then we've all just increased our network and we have a moment in time to reflect upon together. I am not going to make all of you guys stand up to see if you're professional. <laughs> Maybe I will later. We'll see. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> so, so Deb, thank you for that. You're always so positive and, and you see the opportunity and everything. So I, I really appreciate that. So Nassim, talking about predictions and what's going on in the marketplace, what are some of the key skill sets for employers? What, what are they seeking right now and maybe even a little bit into the future? All right. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for hosting this again. Um, this, and good afternoon, everyone. Nassim Malik. I'm with uh, MRA Global. We're an executive search firm um, specializing in sourcing, supply management, uh, procurement, based in Chicago. So, like uh, my friend Aaron on the, on this panel, I'm a recovering uh, procurement practitioner uh, and consultant as well. So, I've been in the uh, function for many years, and now for the past several years, been on the uh, uh, the talent sourcing side. So very good question, right, in terms of uh, skill set. So if we look at it from uh, two ways, one, current skills uh, that companies uh, are looking at, uh, some things we've picked up, and then um, a little bit more about, you know, as they're going out and um, hiring new folks. So, you know, talking to a, uh, we had another panel with a bunch of uh, clients recently, and, you know, on the service side, for instance, banking, insurance, uh, some of those clients were like, oh, we're scrambling now to find people within our company, the talent uh, within procurement that had actually bought the direct materials before because now we need PPE and we don't know anything about buying uh, PPE. We have no idea uh, where to go find suppliers, how to qualify them, how to make sure we're going to get uh, the goods that we need and we're not going to get ripped off in the process. So that's very interesting, right, to see them finding those skill set internally of procurement folks that know how to do um, some of the direct procurement side. Um, and then um, for those that were already in that space, right, uh, we have other manufacturing clients that were beginning to focus on, okay, we got to work closely with supply chain. So if anybody had experience on the supply side, on the materials management side, on the production side, right, helping on the scheduling, right, how do you freeze schedules, how do you push out inventory, right, how can we do, um, how can we help our companies uh, improve our working capital? So all of those things became really critical. Um, and then when you think about internally, right, so um, what they're looking to bring in, obviously the number one thing is on the risk side. Um, you know, they want to, they want talent that is comfortable on the technology side, uh, knows all the different supplier risk uh, management tools that are out there. I think that's one of the things that even in a recent Deloitte survey last year, CPOs had mentioned that the digitization piece continues to be a struggle on how do we manage supply chain risk with supply relationships. So that's going to continue to stay important, especially now as we're looking at tier two, tier three suppliers, and then on the contract management side as well, right, as contracts uh, are continue to get upended, right, force majeure is taken on a brand new uh, life of its own. Anybody that didn't even know what that was is now an expert in it. So contractual piece is important. And then lastly, real quick, um, the ability now to be comfortable uh, and tech savvy, right? So you've got to be, uh, you've got to get really comfortable on Microsoft Teams or whether it's Slack, uh, whether it's Zoom, right? All these things that uh, maybe some Luddites within the organization had no idea what it was or had no inclination to learn need to get on that real fast, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that is the essential way to communicate right now. You've got to be able to collaborate and you've got to be able to motivate, uh, self-motivate, right? You've got to be able to lead your teams as well. So all these tools are imperative for you to be able to utilize this. Uh, I think we'll hear later from Rushi on how she has successfully onboarded with the new company and yeah. she can speak to it a lot more. So yeah. those are some, some highlights. So, so I'm going to summarize a little bit that it sounds like people who have varied backgrounds a broader skill set, maybe not as narrow of a skill set, are in a little bit of a higher demand right now. Is that is that basically? And then tech savviness was also a, a major theme that I that I pulled out of your comments. So is that about right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Much much more eloquent and succinct than my rambling. But yes, <laughs> what she said. <laughs> yes, uh, that's that's awesome. Okay, thanks, Nassim. So so here, Aaron. Um, so for for many who have joined today, maybe are they're looking for their next role. Um, and so I would love to get your perspective on how can someone go about finding their next position? And um, we hear it all the time. I hear it in, in GWPP a lot. I'm applying for jobs, but nobody contacts me. Yes. Okay, great questions. Um, quick intro. 
Actually, there's a procurement executive friend on here who just told me that I look like the cutest air traffic controller. So, <laughs> oh, I, I apologize for losing my AirPods. So whatever. Um, hey, listen, I, I spent a career leading supply chain inventory procurement, uh, built the first procurement teams at PetSmart and Ulta Beauty. I'm a builder. I love building things and then realized I wanted to build my own company. So I uh, created a uh, recruiting and consulting company uh, five years ago and been doing that ever since. And I love it. It's a lot of procurement supply chain, but we extend across all corporate type uh, positions and spend a lot of time in the community helping people with their own job searches. So th these are very common questions. Um, first about how to find the, ne the next position. Um, depends what study you look at. My, my research says 2.7%. I've seen others that say 3.4. So let's just round it up. 3% of the time when you apply for a job, you're actually gonna hear something meaningful back from the company. Yet, when job hunters are trying to figure out how to find the next position, they're very often spending 90 plus percent of their time applying to jobs. It doesn't match up. So I would suggest if 3% of the time works to get a response, I would only spend 3% of my time doing it. I really would. Um, you can either find your own job or you can get found. And then regarding finding your own job, uh, that's all about networking. It really is. And networking, not, you know, not calling people up and saying, hey, I'm out, of, I'm out of work and I really want to find a new position, help me out. But that's when you contact people you know or people who they know, who you're referenced to or referred to, set up a coffee meeting, set up a quick chat and ask them about their backgrounds. Show sincerity, be curious. People love talking about themselves uh, and they'll do it all day long if you show a real interest. They will always ask at the end, well, tell me about yourself or what can I do for you? And that's when you, you don't ask, hey, do you have any jobs? You ask, hey, who else should I talk to? Get a couple more names. So make these types of discussions and introductions and conversations part of your weekly plan. Think of it like, think of a job search or a job change like a job by itself. It's not only, you know, sending in applications and then being devastated that, that stupid recruiters and companies don't give you the time of day, don't respond back. Um, take control of that. And then as far as getting found, I maybe talk about that later if we have time or people could reach out to me. But the idea, Deb, Deb also started talking about this idea of, of sharing your own marketing, personal branding message. Um, you have to be able to differentiate yourself and talk about uh, yourself differently than people will view your peers. Other folks who are going to get found on LinkedIn by lazy recruiters who pay thousands of dollars a year for the privilege of using LinkedIn, like Google, Think of it like Google. You need good content. You need the right keywords and phrases. You need to share your brand messages clearly and succinctly. That's a powerful way to start getting found because it puts you in a different position of power rather than only having to go push, push to try to find new jobs. All right. So um, there's, uh, there's a chat going on right now. Um, I don't know, Aaron, if you have been noticing it. but No, I'm ignoring there's, it. There's some curiosity on? about the, the name of your company. Oh, Murdoch Mason. There's some familial family names. Honestly, it started out because I thought it sounded bigger and more established than uh, other firms. I wanted to compete with the big guys. We compete with the biggest firms on the planet and do a fantastic job, take away searches from them and do consulting work that they would have otherwise done. But it, it's simply because we, we've been in their shoes. We've worked in corporate roles. And as the company's grown, it's, uh, it's, it sounds, sounds more established, but now it is. It just took a while to get there. <laughs> Question. Love it. Love it, love it. It's all about branding. Um, so, um, so I here's here's the wonderful part about our panel today. We have obviously you've met three of the the four panelists so far, and they're all bringing very different perspectives. I'd like to ask Rushi the next question. Rushi has uh, our four our our fourth perspective on the panel today as um, someone who just recently landed a new role. So, Rushi, what techniques did you use to find this current role that you just started? Sure. Uh, thanks, Amanda, uh, for the introduction. So just a little bit about me, um, Ruchi Vidawala. I currently work for FMC Corporation. I'm the uh, procurement transformation lead in our uh, global procurement facilities and corporate sustainability group. Um, so it's actually quite a great role. Um, and I'm, you know, been it's been what two months. Uh, so I I started this job right in the middle of all of this. So I'm I'm happy to be able to provide my perspective here. Um, in terms of the techniques, uh, you know, in finding the current role, I, you know, LinkedIn is actually one of my favorite um, avenues to to search for jobs. 
Um, I would echo what Nassim and Aaron have said around, uh, you know, building your network, building out your network and having the keywords in your profile to make sure that people can find you, right? So fortunately for me, uh, this role kind of found me. Um, but in terms of determining whether or not um, it was the right fit for me, there were definitely things that I was looking for, right? So I, I, I had tirelessly, I was endlessly looking on LinkedIn to, to find the type of role that I'm looking for. I have a background in consulting and this is really my first job in industry. And I wanted, you know, that transition in and of itself can become a challenge. And so what I wanted to make sure I did was find the type of role that's going to provide that dynamic experience that I bring from consulting, right? So I think, and Nassima alluded to that, that's the kind of thing employers are looking for today. And I was fortunate enough to have that background. So when I was looking for the roles, the techniques I was using, you know, the job description is a big thing for me, right? The way the job description is written by a company, it very much alludes to what that company stands for and how the interview process works and all of that, right? So as much as I was looking and searching on LinkedIn, I was also making sure that I assessed the role for the type of uh, experience that I was looking for, right? To be in a fast paced kind of a cultural environment while not having to travel every day of the week. So, you know, the, I, I like to use LinkedIn. I like to use my um, evaluation of the job description. And then, um, as I said, this role found me, but it was very, you know, through a recruiter. And it was, it was great because I had kept my um, LinkedIn profile updated and relevant. And I think it made it easier for people to find me that way. We're going to have so much more conversation about LinkedIn. I know Deb's like, about ready to jump out of her chair. <laughs> I'm here to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I applaud it. I love it. I'm with LinkedIn nerds like me. It's great. <laughs> so, um, and congratulations, by the way, for for the wonderful role. It's um, so exciting to see someone who has made the transition out of consulting into a practice role and seems so happy about it. Um, yeah. Amid all of this. So, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So, Nassim. You, we have many organizations right now um, are on hiring freezes, but there are still a lot of people who are looking for that next role, a promotion progression in their careers. What actions can be taken to better position us uh, to, uh, to hire strong talent um, um, amongst what's sure to be a competitive landscape once we reopen hiring? Okay. Um, yeah, so from this perspective, if we think about um, companies right now, right, there are certain sectors, obviously, that are going to be stronger in terms of that are hiring a lot more right now, right, think pharma, food, um, even on the transportation side, and obviously the tech companies continue to stay strong. But what we're seeing, and, you know, as we're talking to clients is um, some of the more progressive ones are getting ahead of this, right? They're saying, okay, we are going to build um, our talent pipeline, right? Some of them have even put in um, just general um, positions out there, descriptions on career opportunities or what it's like to work at our company. In fact, there's a food company here in Chicago that did that about a month ago. Um, so that actually helps uh, to keep a, their brand alive, right? Number two, shows that the company is uh, forward-looking and they do want to build out uh, teams and they want to keep an eye out for uh, A players, right, that have good talent out there. Um, and then they can also, some of the ones that want to take it a step forward, what companies are doing, they're beginning to have conversations, right? They're beginning to say, okay, you know, let's get some of these candidates on the hook right now. Right? Let's learn more about them. Let's put them in our, uh, in our database, you know, making sure that uh, when the time comes and we have future opportunities, we can map them to the, uh, to the right people. So what uh, Rushi mentioned just now, is, it's, it's important to do, right? It's important to um, keep, your, uh, keep yourself active, keep your identity strong on LinkedIn, right? Keep that going. And Deb's going to talk uh, mm -hmm. a lot more about that as well, too. Because um, that's going to help, um, you know, not just um, recruiters, like she said, um, found her, who uh, is a, actually a friend of ours and somebody I've worked with, uh, Leslie Harold. But then also even companies, right? Even companies that are out there proactively looking will we'll have a much better job. We'll do a much better job identifying uh, talent. And as we talk to candidates, uh, we, get, um, we get favorable uh, input from them that, yeah, you know, this company, ABC, is out there looking for um, building relationships, right? D developing that connection with us. Um, because all too often you hear the other side, what Aaron mentioned earlier, that you apply and it goes into an abyss, right? Mm -hmm. You never hear back from them again. So that's some of the things that we advise as we're talking, you know, we've talked to clients that have said, yeah, we need to hire. There's just too much uncertainty right now. Now, May numbers uh, were a little bit better uh, than April numbers. So the tide is going to be uh, stemming, hopefully, 
demand is going to be uh, hopefully picking up, but that's the big uncertainty. So as soon as they get a better handle on what happens there, they will start. They will start on manufacturing. They will start on other sectors, and they want to get ahead of it and have that talent they can start with. So that's interesting how how companies are differentiating themselves around. Um, you know, while they might not be able to hire now, they're still thinking strategically about how they proceed forward um, in the coming months. So I, I love to hear that. I, I haven't even. Um, I didn't even realize that was going on. So thank you for bringing that up. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, right. And just uh, on the other side of it, on the flip side, I would be remiss if I didn't mention what some good, sold, altruistic people out there are doing, like my friend Aaron, in which he started this with, I think, a couple other people on the data analytics side. I'll let him talk about that, in which, you know, you find these dozens and dozens of people that are looking, and he connected them with, uh, he put it on LinkedIn, and then open, kind of like an open source saying, yeah, companies, here's great talent, find them. We're not going to charge you, right? This isn't a monetization play. Mm -hmm. This is a play to connect talent with uh, the right people. And I think uh, maybe he'll talk about that a little bit. That yielded some good results. So in these unprecedented times, anything we can do to help um, candidates and companies um, make that connection is a good thing as well, regardless okay. of what you people think about us recruiters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be a mic drop right yeah. there. <laughs> no, no. I was kidding. All right. So Aaron, um, we've, you already mentioned differentiation and I think it's, it's come up now uh, quite a few times in the answers. What can people on the phone today do to di differentiate themselves from others who are interested in the same type of roles? Um, I think that personal brand is really important. You're going to know best what makes you different from other people. But the perspective you need to have is if you are a company looking at you and a hundred other people who seem qualified for the position, what is it that's gonna make you stand out? It's not enough just to say, well, I have all the qualifications they're asking for, why aren't they hiring me? It's more about helping them, it's about not requiring them to interpret your background. They need to be able to quickly understand exactly what kind of business problems you solve. And I would frankly use your headline, use your summary, the most valuable real estate in your LinkedIn profile, uh, use a use a career summary at the top of your resume and explain that, but not in three paragraphs that nobody's going to read. Mm -hmm. Your your headline on your LinkedIn summary uh, or LinkedIn profile, a few words. What is it you do? Don't put your current title. Recruiters can easily find that anyway. Tell us who you are, what you do that's different. And your summary, make it short, but make it really impactful. And then fill it in with additional information after that. Um, again, I think that question about what business problem you solve is really critical. Um, I had a, I, I led strategy at Ulta Beauty for the last two and a half years before I, I started this company. And, uh, but I had a strategy professor that says, if you can't fit a mission statement on a coffee mug, it's junk. Uh, and I would say the same kind of thing about your personal brand. If you have to explain and explain or require someone to figure out what value you can provide, they have a hundred other candidates who look like they match the job and they can go pick them instead. Um, and I really think it's about connecting in the right kinds of platforms. Um, I don't have specifics to share now, but uh, coming soon, there will be a brand new platform for employers, actual vetted jobs and vetted procurement supply chain professionals to connect to make it a lot easier rather than the shotgun approach of LinkedIn or Indeed or Career Builder. You can actually have detailed, connected, close um, contact between employers and, uh, and, and candidates. So more, more to come there, wink, wink. But um, I really think it's about, it's about that personal brand. Um, find your way to find a way to explain what business problems you solve and how you stand out versus your peers in the eyes of the companies that you're applying to. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> last year, uh, uh, several of our first GWPP sessions were all about personal branding. That's all we talked about. And it was interesting for the women on the phone today and maybe even some of the men um, there is such a roadblock around this feeling that we are promo over promoting ourselves. And so there was a lot of conversation about how do you position yourselves? How do you get over that fear uh, to really con to create this very strong brand for yourself? So that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. I highly encourage everyone. There's, um, there's uh, videos that we, 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 vi we record everything. So there are videos on personal branding that we already have out there if you want to. Um, you know, enhance your personal brand, please look up those resources because it's so critically important right now. Yeah, I, I just add really quickly that, you know, there's 400 million profiles on LinkedIn. A recruiter, especially the lazy ones, the terrible ones, they, they only want to get to 50 people as fast as possible. If you don't have the right words or phrases or ways to catch their attention, 
then it doesn't matter what other information is in your profile. So, so yeah. succinct clarity is really important. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. So before I move on to Rushi, I have, I have a, we, we have a question that came in from uh, the audience and we do love questions from the audience. So we built in plenty of time for questions today. So um, there's a question around, is there a downside to working as a contractor for large corporations? What are the chances of full conversion to a full-time role um, based off of your experience? So the, the contract to hire route, is that a favorable route? And I would love, love maybe Aaron and Nassim to, to answer, to give your opinion on that. I'll give a real quick answer. Yeah. Um, it depends on how well you think you're going to perform in the role. If you do a great job in that position, it's highly likely that they're going to find a way to put you somewhere else in the company. And it's a pretty common way companies are trying people out before they hire them. It's not a guarantee though. So um, the downside is, yeah, you have an end date for when this might end, but the upside is you might have a leg up on anybody else who's going to apply for the job because they're going to see your work product. Mm -hmm. So if you think you're good at what you do, it could be a really good route to uh, getting in a company that otherwise wouldn't hire directly. Okay. Right. And just to add on that real quick, um, that, that's a very good question. That's a question we get asked often, right? So usually in the realm of if somebody has been laid off or furloughed or um, is in between successes, as we like to call it, all right, sometimes it's uh, looked upon negatively that, oh, we don't want to be an independent cons consultant or independent contractor. What we tell them is it's better to be working, right? What Aaron said in terms of you're getting into a company, you're getting the experience. It's better to be working, gaining that experience, right? You have um, you have something to show, your skill sets are still going to be used and sharp, and then that could become a full-time opportunity if you so choose, right? Now, if somebody has a full-time job right now and for them to leave that and go to become an uh, independent contractor, that doesn't happen very often, right? Um, though it has been happening more and more over the past five to seven years, right? There's a big shift in the marketplace, the contingent workforce is growing, right? More and more people want to be those uh, independent uh, mercenaries, right? They want to be... Um, contractors and that's a that's a lifestyle they choose so um, we don't recommend for you to leave a full-time job and become that but if you don't have anything right now and the alternative is looking for a job versus at least getting in and showing that it's not a bad route to well, take. so are you saying that I should not have left my full-time position to start my companies no You're that's the wrong guys no 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 yeah exactly no, no, not, for, no, no, not for entrepreneurs right <laughs> yes. an entrepreneur, that's completely different uh, but typically people that you know are in between Yes. successes and are looking for their next and thinking whether or not we should do this. So. It, it is in the scene. It's actually interesting. The reason why I bring that up is because when I, when I left corporate, um, it was an, it was amazing amount of people who approached me asking me, am I, am I just in between jobs? Right. Um, so it is a very common, you know, your advice is spot on. It's a great way to transition um, and to, ex to gain additional experience. And we're getting some comments and um, agreeing with you too on, on these comments. So it's a, it's, it was great, great advice. So Rushi, going back to differentiating yourself in the marketplace and keep the questions coming in from, from the audience. So uh, obviously you landed your, your role. I'm, I'm curious around the techniques that you use to differentiate yourself against others who were applying for that role. Um, interesting. So, so I recently discovered my personal brand uh, seems to be procurement athlete. Um, and I think what set me apart, which is interesting you asked me that because now being in the company and having the role that I have, I was able to gain some insight as to what did set me apart from anyone else that interviewed for the same position that I'm in now. And it turns out that specifically what FMC was looking for in this, in this role was someone that would be able to pick up a subject, uh, relatively quickly, someone that would be able to be comfortable with uncertainty. Um, because the fact is, and this was explained to me at the time, that this role particularly that I'm doing has a time horizon of end of 2021. And after that, while the plan would be to find me another role within FMC, we don't know what that's going to be. So I needed to be comfortable with that uncertainty, knowing that if I do a good job, my company is going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I think those two aspects of being, and then, and then coming in with a, pers with a fresh perspective, but being able to execute on a plan that they've already got in place. So I think, um, I think those three things are, are what differentiated me uh, when I was applying for this role, right? I think more and more now companies are looking for, and I think this ties in well to that question around, you know, being a, should I become a contractor or what have you, right? A lot more companies are looking for flexibility around what um, an individual is hired to do versus where they will end up long-term, right? 
uh, building um, building leadership and building capabilities and having people move around in different areas within let, within procurement versus being niche to you know let's say only sourcing or only you know contract management whatever it might be more companies are looking for someone that has that broad spectrum has the ability to shift around and pick up that topic uh, quickly enough where then you can drive impact and change um, more immediately uh, but then also being comfortable with the uncertainty that you know you may not be doing this for a long time um, or for, for the remainder of your time at a, at a company, but that if you do a good job, your company will take care of you. And I think that has a lot to do with, uh, with where you go to work, right? Not everywhere has that type of mindset. Not every, not every company has that type of culture. And so that's, you know, that's part of the technique to even evaluate whether the role is the right fit for you. But I think those three things set me apart from the candidates that I was okay not knowing where I would be at the end of next year. And I was okay uh, not having had direct experience in the area that they wanted me to, to take on, but exuding through my interview and through my, um, uh, through my resume that I've done such a variety of projects in the past that I can figure this out quickly. Mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. So I heard learning agility, which mm -hmm. is something that um, you talked a lot about and resiliency. Yes. Yeah. That would be a very nice succinct yeah. way to sum that up as well. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of conversation about learning agility and, and resiliency on, on our webinar. So um, it's, a, it's a common topic and loved, um, love that you were able to have those examples in your past where you can bring them to light and show that you have those traits. So kudos to you. So Deb, yes, we're going to, we're going to talk about LinkedIn. Woohoo! I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So we've already mentioned LinkedIn a couple of times and, and Aaron pointed out that there's some detractors and there's some very great things about LinkedIn. But um, why is LinkedIn an important piece of any professional's personal brand? Absolutely. Well, I'm so excited that I can quote the other panelists here because I'm taking <laughs> diligent notes right now. Um, I think Aaron said at first the position of power and then also identity strong was brought up. It's the idea that when you invest yourself digitally, I don't care what social platform it is, we always start at zero, right? You're at zero followers, you're at zero influence, you're, you're just nobody out there until you begin making connections. And you can click all the people that you know, but that is still not an authentic relationship, nor is it uh, invite an opportunity for interaction and growth and just uh, and having conversations. So what happens and what is needed, and especially with the, this idea of identity strong, position of power, you have to start participating as part of the community. If you are the silent one in the corner, uh, you are not gonna gain any traction in what people know you and your personality. Because it is the sort of thing that, you know, if you think way back to when LinkedIn, way back, you know, I don't know, a couple decades ago when LinkedIn was started, it was just a bunch of people looking for a job at that moment. But then all these people found jobs. And so they started talking to each other about their jobs. And to the point where now 50% of LinkedIn is B2B transactions and people engaging in awesome opportunities, no different than what GWPP is over 4,000 members on LinkedIn. I mean, what an incredible audience that if you are in procurement and you know that you're in transition or someday you'll be in transition because what's the average number of jobs or opportunities someone goes through now? You need to be posting about what's most important to you and bringing that to the masses. Because when people over and over see the seems post about things, it's called top of the mind awareness. They don't have to be in a conversation with that individual to go, oh wait, yeah, he is that expert. That's right, oh, our, you know, our company's looking for something like that. So that is the cycle of communication. And you know, as I work with clients and companies, you just have to start with one. And what's great about all of this is LinkedIn has a very short attention span. <laughs> You're going to post something. If it does well, that post is going to last longer. If it doesn't, eh, it pretty much flies away into the LinkedIn land of purgatory. But you keep trying until you see a reaction from your audience that it actually builds up. And you'll be surprised that people love to get to know you personally. You're posting articles, you're posting this, you're posting that, but if all of a sudden you post something personal about how something affected you or how you give value to others, it's not about a sales pitch, it's not about asking for a job, it's going back to even what you have on your resume and other places, what is the business problem you solve? And you hit that every single time in some way that you do things. So it takes time, it takes stepping out of your comfort zone, but it is possible for amazing things to happen and grow over time. It is so darn true. Absolutely. So I, I'm going to share a, a personal experience here and I'll, I'll leave names out of it. But Deb, the part of the reason why I know Deb is Deb has been helping me and my companies do what she's talking about. So she's been um, the brains behind what I do on LinkedIn um, day in and day out. So I truly appreciate everything that she's been able to do and help me with. 
But I now, because of the work that we've done and the brand presence that we've been able to create, I have people who, um, you know, I'll have a conversation with them. They don't really know me very well, but I have a conversation and then they start talking about what we're doing in their networks and they, the people in their networks already know me or they know of the content that we're creating. So it is, it has this dramatic multiplier effect where the people who you're talking to directly, um, you, you're building a relationship with, but, but then they, they, people around them already know who of you, um, and know what you stand for. Influence. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. And if I could say one more thing there, as you get more involved in LinkedIn and actually participate where you're not just putting out content, but you're finding other content to comment on, like share, you're cheering on others, be a cheerleader every day. Don't turn on the news, go on LinkedIn and find five people to say great job to. It's amazing how things change. But what begins happening, the more you put yourself out there, all of a sudden LinkedIn's algorithm rewards you. And the more people then begin to try to find you. And that's where this platform, think about not right now, but where do you want to be three years from now? Do you want to just open up your LinkedIn every day and have 10 new people asking to request you? And of course, you're going to accept some, maybe not all, but it's an opportunity then to let yourself be known out there and always um, to invite opportunity to you and then give back with your value over and over again. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hey, and, and Deb, people are asking where to find the personal branding videos on the GWP. Oh, platform. excellent. Yes. So we, um, well, I think what we'll do is we'll have to do another link um, yeah. to make sure that everything gets there. So yeah. we'll work that out. So, so glad. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll get that to you, Erica. Okay. All right. So, um, Nassim, uh, how can I keep myself, when we're talking about development here, right? right. And there's opportunities. How can I keep myself truly essential <laughs> to my current employer? while keeping my personal brand alive or growing it and um, creating a strong uh, presence in the external marketplace. Okay, good. Well, first of all, for the personal brand, now that we have a superstar on here, right? So I think Deb, you're gonna make us all superstars, right? Especially the panel. Absolutely. So we're, for, we're first in line, right? So uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to hook up with you on that. Uh, great, great advice there. Um, yeah, this is one of the things that uh, comes up as we're talking to candidates and even clients is, Right in this t time of uh, volatility out there, a lot of uncertainty. I mean, we all hear the the dreaded stats, right? Forty plus million unemployed. How we went from, you know, the best uh, market in 50 years to one of the worst in 70 plus years. So there's a lot of apprehension on there. How do we keep ourselves uh, essential, right? How do we stay employed? So you know, a lot of those things are you know common sense that we're all aware of. How to in this time. I don't think it's a problem. Most people I'm talking to right now um, that are in corporate in a corporate environment are working harder than they've ever had, mm -hmm. right? They're they're burning out to the point where it's 12, 14 hours, and now you see um, all types of C-level folks uh, forcing people to take a day off, right? Don't get burned out, and no Friday meetings or take Friday off every month. So those are the things, right? You know, you're talking about in this environment uh, to lean in um, and you know over deliver, right? So that part I think we're all pretty familiar with. What I wanted to talk a little bit about was. Uh, a recent article in HBR uh, magazine was talking about one of the ways to truly make yourself uh, um, valuable to your employer, you know, both midterm and long term, is go find a strategic side hustle. So I was fascinated to read that, and they laid it out, you know, a great, uh, uh, a great case for it. And Deb, I think that will be my post, maybe tomorrow, right? I'll put that on there on LinkedIn, <laughs> and I'll uh, refer to this article. But it's uh, it's really good, right? Talking about, you know, why we're going to do this, right? It's going to help expand your career. You should seek out diverse experiences and then go into a variety of industries and, and functions, right? Get out of what you're doing day to day. So if we're in procurement supply management, right? Go into uh, accounting or finance or marketing or go into account management or sales if that's something that you want to do. So some of the things they're talking about is, right? Go try to find membership in a nonprofit organization or some kind of a board. Look into teaching, a fellowship, um, publishing, right? Publishing like you talked about, content, right? Writing articles. Uh, participating in associations. They even go as far as saying, hey, find a civic or public service that you can contribute to. Um, and then my favorite, advising uh, and investing in startups, right? Find those companies right now. Um, the, the, the internet business world is just unfathomable right now, how much business is out there, how these startup companies are growing by the day. A lot of young talent in there. So if you've got skills you can offer, um, whether it's supply chain skills or talent sourcing skills, go find those companies to be an advisor to. Um, and then, you know, you've got to go back and show that value to your company, your organization, right? You're going to, you're going to show, look, we're going to find the time. We're going to identify roles. This is how it's going to help us and how it's going to help the company, right? We're building knowledge. We're building skills. Then we're building confidence mm -hmm. and we're going to become a better team member, a better employee 
by making these connections um, in the outside world. And these connections help us become better innovators and better managers. So um, excellent uh, advice there. That's something that really resonated with me and something um, I think that would be important for us um, as we continue to not just focus on internal, but on the external side as well. It's fantastic advice. I'm actually thinking of so many other things I, I could be doing right now. <laughs> You're doing too much. Stop, Amanda. You got too many things going on. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's good. And it, it, it's very fulfilling at the same time because not only are you developing yourself and, and helping your brand, but you, you are helping others when you go out and you do that type of work. So it's a, it's a great way to also give back. So, um, yeah, fantastic advice. So um, I'm going to shift a little bit to uh, over to Rushi because I would love your perspective on, you know, we're talking about trying to find your next role, but I would love for you to share your perspective on what's it like to get a new role in the middle of this chaos that we're living through right now. Um, some people on the phone might be close to landing their next gig and it's, it's not, not the same as what it was just six months ago. So can you give us um, a little bit of a perspective around that? How did you go about making such a great impression uh, virtually, which would be hard, right? Because you're not in person, and then amidst such chaos that's going on right now. Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I would say uh, Teams has been a huge part of all of this. Um, uh, starting this role, it, I think I started it right around the same time that the stay-at-home orders came out um, kind of across the country. And, you know, it, I, I can tell you I've never had more meetings on my calendar than I do now, right? Um, being virtual has had its challenges. Um, I think what I was fortunate enough to have was a good type of good onboarding type of um, uh, preparation that was done prior to my joining. Uh, you know, before I joined, um, FMC did a really good job of making sure my equipment, um, my you know my computer and all of that equipment came to that came to my home um, and then they also scheduled a bunch of meetings on my calendar for the first week right um, everyone that i was transitioning with and i think that was very instrumental in uh ensuring that i was able to figure out what my role entailed um making the impression involved a lot of asking of questions i had to make sure i had to make sure that i was not afraid to reach out to the people or ask someone who to reach out to in the event that i had a question because because one of the challenges, although it's so nice to be able to work from home, um, and you know, I, I wouldn't complain about it at all, but the one challenge that I have noticed is my ability to just go to my neighbor's office and ask the question that I wanna ask and get my answer right away now becomes a challenge because I have to compile all my questions and check their calendar. Are they available? If I'm seeing them, are they in a meeting? Are they presenting, right? There's all these different challenges that come with that onboarding. And I think a lot of companies have done a pretty good job in pivoting and making sure that, you know, if they plan on hiring and plan on bringing somebody in to, to leverage all this technology that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I hadn't, if I hadn't had uh, those meetings scheduled for me, or at least had asked to get those meetings scheduled to onboard me in the beginning, I would have been lost. But uh, fortunately, the team of people that I'm working with have been so great that they gave me a lot of the information. And then over after, you know, drinking from the water hose for the first few <laughs> weeks, um, I started to get my footing, right? I started to understand what was going on uh, in the company as a whole. I started to understand how all of my little projects uh, kind of tied together and how they formed the larger picture, right? So asking the right questions or not being afraid to ask people the questions or ask them to cl clarify or asking them what an acronym means, right? Everyone was very understanding of the fact that I'm very new. Even the industry itself is very new to me. I've never worked in the chemicals industry before. So um, I think all of those things helped with making that impression. And just the fact that I was able to now, now I'm able to speak intelligent, intelligently about our projects, about procurement, about our company. And I think just taking that personal initiative to go and figure those things out rather than, you know, being worried about, I was, and I was frankly terrified when I, before I started, is like, how am I going to figure out everything I need to do? Because when I got the offer, stay at home orders weren't in place, right? So I was assuming I would go into the office and have this great office, but um, not having that, you know, I had to, I had to take those extra steps to go through the process of familiarizing myself, right? Because as much as it is the responsibility to some degree of the company to onboard you, it is also your own responsibility to just go and figure some things out and ask the right questions. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I love your comment about asking the right questions. There's such a talent 
in you, the ability, it just in procurement in general, if you can ask really great questions and drill in and not just ask the, the top line question, but ask the repeated questions to drill in, it, it's, it goes so, so far and not only onboarding, but just your day-to-day -day relationship building, et cetera. So yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Did we lose Aaron? The air traffic controller has a. <laughs> uh oh, it looks like it. Aaron. He's back. There you go. There you go. Hi, Aaron. Back on the radar. Did you? Did, oh, wait. Maybe. <laughs> Speaking of things out. Oh, he's he's going like on and off of mute. Oh, come back to me. I no, you're good. Sound. You're good. I can I can hear you. We can hear you. Well, we got you back. Are you good? Nope, he's typing away. We can hear his keyboard. We can hear his <laughs> keyboard. So the funny part is I was going to ask him about office politics and maybe that maybe that was just too much. Um, so um, Hang on, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, oh, can. all right. I'll forget the air traffic controller stuff. Okay. You're fine. Yeah, you're all right. Here. So so Aaron, I um we were just I was just joking. We're gonna talk about office politics, which what everyone loves. So maybe maybe that was why you dropped off. Um, <laughs> um so you're, the question I want to ask you is, I don't think many people love office politics, but sometimes you feel like you're doing a great job, but you're not getting noticed or promoted and you think it's because of office politics, which might be very true. So what do you do in that situation? Yeah, I'm going to challenge you to think whether or not you believe that office politics are ethical or not. That's where, often where people have an issue, where they think, um, that if they engage in office politics, somehow that betrays their own ethics. I'm gonna tell you that office politics are very real and it is very true that the people who advance fastest and highest are very often better at office politics than those who don't. And it's, I, I say fair is an F word and I wouldn't use it, but the idea is that it really is not fair, but it's true. The, the challenge I give you, because I hear this a lot, that I wanna progress in my career, but I don't wanna play political games. I've said that myself you're missing the fact that there is a positive connotation of politics that can help your career progression. And we just focus on the negative side. Mm -hmm. um, workplace politics don't need to be a bad thing. You can develop your political savvy. That's the way I would call it. You wanna call it politics, but it really is political savvy and getting people to, to uh, agree as a coalition, getting people to listen to your ideas, getting different ideas pushed forward when there are lots of choices for a business. That's real strategy. So political savvy is important and you can do that and stay ethical at the same time. Politics are actually neutral. They can be constructive, regardless of what you believe right now in the world. But the point is that um, you can choose how to engage your environment and take more control over how you're going to go to the company rather than sitting back and being passive and saying, they should notice the great work I do. I do it all well. I do it better than these other people. They get promoted faster than me. You need to find a way to increase your political savvy, get more engaged, have more coffee meetings internally, build a network inside the company so you can start influencing real decisions in the business. And that is what's gonna pay off when it comes time for promotions or avoiding layoffs of the organization. That's the way to get known. It's not only great work. That's the minimum requirement. You want to be fantastic and you want to be great, then find a way to increase your political savvy as well. Yeah. I, I think I, I usually like to call it influence. You have to you have to have the ability to influence and create positive influence within organizations. And so so uh, I think we're using the same word, the same concept, two different words, but um, but great, great advice. And I want to also thank you for your amazing typing skills. <laughs> he answered all our questions. <laughs> it wasn't even like short answers. It was like awesome. very, very long, detailed <laughs> answers. So kudos. He's, that, that. he's I actually in a small town, and the only thing we had to do was a typing game on our Zenith computer, so I can go 120. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other thing, Amanda, to what you just said, and Aaron, I think uh, an important factor, great point on the political savviness is, is the allies part, right? Yes. That's what we that's what we hear all the time, right? So in order to have that po political savviness you need to find internal sponsors, allies, people that can help you toot your own horn, people that can speak highly of you as well, and influential people. So to those coffee meetings, uh, Aaron, absolutely find those people. And it also gets into, you know, people ask, should I have mentors? What kind of mentors should I have, right? What kind of a relationship should I have? How can I help them? So all of that factors into that, so. Yeah, you know, we like to, 
we've talked about it at GWPP that taking that mentor concept to a higher level and actually having champions. Exactly. You. And I think yep. that the ally concept, but someone who, when you're being talked about in circles, can stand up for who you are, what you can produce, and, and your potential for the future is just so critically important for career progression. And Teresa in the chat box made a good point of find opportunities to help others. Yes. Yes. And yeah. we, we all know that we have that moment of desperation when something happens to us that we weren't expecting. So when we're able to reach out to others and help empower them, oh my goodness, it just becomes yep. awesome. Yep, it does. So Deb, I'm going to wrap up with you. Um, Boy, responsibility. Gonna, I know we started with you. We're going to wrap up with you, and then we might have a, a minute or, uh, or so for questions. But um, people have so many options right now. So they might want to be going back into the corporate world. They might actually be looking at branching out on their own and starting a new business. So what if if you're in that camp where you want to start your own business? What advice do you have for those folks? The advice is go for it. I mean, what is so neat about where we are, finally, I think we're getting there, is you don't just have to have a full-time job. You can have opportunities. Uh, one of the best men I know who uh, was in a jobs transition for quite some time, he was an electrical engineer, but he loved making salsa. <laughs> so guess what? Make salsa on the weekends and take it to every farmer's market and be an electrical engineer during the week. Uh, when, for those of you who haven't been on any of our LinkedIn's yet, get there. But my LinkedIn is a strawberry farmer corn maze gyro restaurant who happens to have her communication marketing uh, you know, company. We can be diverse in what we do because of the technology available to us to get the message out there, but you develop skill sets when you're having to hustle on your own and not just hustle for someone else, that when you bring that back to the workplace only makes you stronger. And start with something simple, uh, whether it's an eBay something or get involved with your kids and, and helping them, the skill set and the opportunities available to you and who you're able to network with, um, it's just absolutely immense. So, you know, I support entrepreneurs a hundred bazillion percent uh, because it's really exciting when you take your message and you make it personal with a product or service that is of value to others. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that has been a fun journey over the last oh year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Everything is different. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and the amount of learning that you, um, you know, I, I always, I share the story of, um, I always thought that I was a very good marketer. Like I could market, I, I led change initiatives and I thought that I was very good at communicating and influencing. And then you start your own something new and realize that, wow, I have so much more to do. <laughs> you're starting at zero, right? Yeah. There's that zero right. again. How do you rebuild? And when you get yeah. better every time of starting at zero, it gets quicker and you yeah. get better and you do more things. So that's right. where it gets exciting. Yeah. All right. So we are, we have two minutes left. Are there any final thoughts? I think, um, thanks to Aaron's amazing typing skills, we got through most of the questions that were coming <laughs> in. Um, so are there any final thoughts from the uh, panelists that you would like to share? I don't know, I'm going to see, maybe I could start with you just really quickly. Yeah, no, great, uh, great session. And I think I saw some of the, uh, the chats going on that, you know, they'll connect with us, reach out. I would encourage that, right? Everyone on this uh, session, please reach out, right? Reach out to all of us. Uh, we're more than willing to help uh, share our perspectives, what we're seeing in the marketplace, um, help connect, help network, and we'll learn from you as well. So yeah. that, that would be my advice. Please reach out and we'd be happy to connect and, and, yeah. and learn. Okay, perfect. Dan? I would say be as authentic online as you would be in person. So if you're at a networking event in person, you're going to shake everyone's hand. You're going to smile at everyone. Do the same thing online. When someone reaches out to you, make sure you reach back out. Uh, make sure you be reciprocal in that manner and amazing relationships will happen. Rushi. Uh, I would just say, you know, don't be afraid of starting a new job in this, in this environment. It works. It's fun. It's uh, exciting. You'll never get to do something like this again. So be open to those opportunities. Uh, that's awesome. Great advice. And Aaron. Uh, I just say, if you're looking for something else, have hope. There's a lot of opportunity and there will always be places hiring for people who can be different, people who can show that they connect. So um, if you're feeling beaten down, that's totally understandable. Look for ways to light your flame. I think you can find them. All right. I loved this so much. We're getting positive comments, both via text message and on the comments. So um, thank you all so much for your expertise that you shared today, Aaron Rushi, Deb, and Nassim, you are phenomenal. I'm so, so honored to be, uh, call you uh, friends and- yeah, Let's do it again. You. Yeah. Do it again live, let's plan. Oh yeah, Absolutely. live session when we can do it again. Let's That's sounds great. All and, right. Aaron, and Aaron's gonna sing for us in that one. Right? Oh yeah, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm technical difficulties. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah.
All right. Thank you so thank much, you everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.